All right, and now I'm so excited to kick off today's event, Lessons to Carry Forward. It's perfectly fine to be imperfect, sponsored by RBC Wealth Management. We're, we're thrilled to be joined by Shireen Luz, Head of Culture and Field Experience at RBC Wealth Management. Um, Shireen, if you could please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your career journey. Absolutely. First, thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, everybody from all over the country and North America. It's so fun. I'm distracted by reading where everybody's from. So thank you. Thank you for joining. I know it is really hard to carve any time out of your schedules. So uh, it means even more uh, that you have taken the time to do so. As Sarah said, I'm Shireen Luz. I am currently the head of culture at RBC Wealth Management. Um, my career journey, um, much like I would imagine most people's is not how I mapped it out. Um, and I'm so pleased for that. I actually um, am an employment litigation attorney by training and spent my early career in private law practice. And a little over 16 years ago, I was fortunate to join RBC in the law group and thought that that was my end all be all job. It was my dream job. I was in house. Um, and about two years in, I got tapped on the shoulder and asked if I wanted to build out our employee relations function in the U.S. And I was like, I, why would I do that? And what is employee relations? Um, but thankfully, the, the people who approached me had more confidence and faith in me than I did. So I was able to spend 10 years um, in that role, building out the function in the U.S. and then getting the opportunity to work on global teams for RBC. So it was an incredible experience. And then about four years ago, a uh, similar opportunity to become the head of HR for wealth management. And I said, I, I, I don't even know what that entails. What would I do? Um, but again, really fortunate leaders who had faith in me and um, ended up getting into the head of HR role. And then the pandemic hit, which was something, as we all know, like that just turned everybody's world upside down. And in the course of that, about a year and a half ago, our CEO and also our president were having a conversation about how important just focusing on employees and the employee experience was. And, you know, we had spent so much time during, you know, the real heaviest part of the pandemic focused on employee safety and well-being. And that was the start of every conversation. And they felt strongly that if we're going to be a successful company, that has to always be the start of the conversation, not just during a pandemic, that you have to focus on and lead with employees first. And so they created the head of culture role and I was fortunate enough to, to get it. And now um, I get to spend my day um, doing my favorite parts of my jobs that I've had in my career. So it, it has been really fantastic. And I'm very, very grateful that um, people pushed me and um, pushed me outside of my comfort zone because I wouldn't be here without that. Wow, that is that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Shereen. That's so cool that you you started off in law and went to HR. And I think I, it's such a great point that you brought up in regards to the pandemic. I think that nobody knows where they're going in their career journey, and the the pandemic comes along and it just messes <laughs> everything up even more. I know I personally experienced that. So thank you for sharing that. Just because I think so many of you know people who are viewing as well right now that probably their career journey has been shaken up a good bit because of the mm -hmm. pandemic. It's such a important thing to just to know that other people are going through as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're here today to talk about lessons to carry forward. It's perfectly fine to be imperfect. Um, I know I'm so, so excited for this topic and I personally definitely need to hear Shireen's thoughts on this and just our community's thoughts on this as well. Um, it's just such an important topic right now, especially just in the, in the remote work world and the hybrid work world um, and just kind of revolving around, you know, how to adapt to the world we live in now. Mm -hmm. um, but before we dive in, I'd love to hear in your own words, Shereen, what that statement means to you. Yeah, so I, I say this often. So anybody who, who knows me, um, I'm a hot mess and not in a good way. And it, 
and I say that often because I just want people to be authentic and feel like they can be real. And when I hear that, you know, we're imperfect. And I know I used to try really hard. I never was perfect, but I used to try to appear perfect and try to keep everything completely in check and that I had it all together all of the time, which clearly I didn't and nobody did. But I really felt like that's how I needed to present myself. And I think to generalize, a lot of times we put, you know, female executives on a pedestal, like they're, you know, so perfect and they've done all of these things and they've got everything perfectly in balance and, you know, they can do, they're the proverbial, you can have it all. Um, and I just want everyone to know you can't do it all. You were never intended to do it all. Superwoman is not real. Um, and that we can do what we need to do and what that is just varies throughout your day and throughout your life. Yeah, and that's so, so important to remember, just remaining, just knowing that nobody's perfect and that authenticity is just so, so valued in the workplace. And I think that, you know, as long as you're authentic and you show vulnerability, I think you could, you know, be as perfect as you can be. Mm -hmm. You know, just showing those two things in the workplace is so important. Um, so thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm curious to know, what self-care activities did you implement into your routine during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. um, and have you continued to stick with any of those self-care activities in your day-to-day -day routine since the pandemic started? Yeah. So I'm going to be, well, I'm I'm always honest. I'm going to be brutally honest here. <laughs> I really struggled with any idea of self-care at the beginning of the pandemic. I was head of HR at the time and we were, you know, frantically trying to shut down branches, get people, you know, the support they need, contact trace different cases throughout the country. And I, I had no self-care. I was working nonstop. Um, I would go days without walking outside of my house. I remember one day I was like, I think this is the fifth day that I have not walked outside. And all I did was go outside to take the garbage out. Wow. And I also started having a glass of wine or two at night, which wasn't something I'd ever done. Mm -hmm. And I adopted a lot of behaviors that just weren't healthy. And like, especially like some of the coping mechanisms, like, well, if I just work more, maybe I won't be so stressed. Or mm -hmm. if I just have a glass of wine, it'll take the edge off. And I had stopped working out. And what ended up happening, obviously, um, no surprise, is it got worse. My stress got worse because my coping me mechanisms were not actually coping mechanisms. And so I had to really stop and take a look at myself and figure out how I was going to create boundaries. I thought prior to the pandemic that I had pretty good boundaries and I completely lost them. So the first thing I did was I started putting, trying to put blocks in my calendar where mm -hmm. I would have, even if it was just a couple hours, I wouldn't have meetings for a couple hours so that I could try to get some work done. Um, I started doing walking meetings or meetings even in a different room um, just to change the scenery. Um, I started really focusing on getting exercise. And if that meant going for a walk during a call, or it meant working out in the morning, like just really trying to, to get some activity back in where I did get outside, even in the Minnesota winter, <laughs> as miserable as that is, it was, it, I needed the fresh air. Um, and the biggest thing was really stopping work and being present with what I'm doing. So being present at work 100% when I'm working or being 100% present when I'm with my family. And I started doing little things like prior to having, I'm fortunate now I have my own workspace, but before that I would still, like I would see my computer and it would just taunt me. And so I started closing the laptop because mm -hmm. for whatever reason, when it was open, it was like talking to me. So I would close the laptop. <laughs> um, I didn't pick up my phone and check messages and emails because if it's truly an emergency, people will find you. They know how to find you. 
um, I don't need to go looking for emergencies. And that's what we're essentially doing when we're checking our emails at night, at least for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, really trying to craft those boundaries and also being an example for not just my kids, but you know, the teams that I work with to say, I'm not working at nine o'clock at night. I don't want you working at nine o'clock at night. Because even when I would say, I, you know, don't work these hours, if I'm doing it, it they're going to feel whether I intend them to feel that way or not, they're going to feel like they should be working as well. And that's, that's just not healthy. So really creating both physical and mental boundaries. And we're now back in the office. And so I work from home sometimes and I walk, work in the office sometimes. And I'm still doing the walking meetings because I just, I think it's so great. So if the other person is open to it and we can be productive that way, we go, we go walking. Um, or I just get out of my office and go to a different space. We're fortunate we have a new building that we moved into a few months ago. And it's beautiful and it's got all these wonderful spaces. We've got wellness rooms where you can go in and it's, you know, quiet and you can dim the lights and just regroup or you can sit in a chair and look out at the beautiful views. But, you know, just getting away, um, some of us uh, get exhausted by other people. And so, mm -hmm. like, I personally just need that downtime where I say, like, I'm not on. I can't people anymore. I just need a break. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that's so, I'm so glad that you brought up just boundaries in general. I think it's so important for, you know, leaders in higher management to just set a great example for, you know, others on their other team members and such. And you brought up such a good point about, you know, if you're logged on at nine o'clock at night, how are they going to feel? They're going to feel like they need to be logged on mm -hmm. at nine o'clock as well. So thank you for bringing that up. It's yeah, very, very important. Just to know um, and to know and just to be aware of for yourself and then for other members on your team. Um, we're going to ask an audience question now and let's see. Okay, it says, I'm an introvert. How do I balance authenticity and showing up as my whole self with my natural inclination to keep my own counsel and seek the solitude of my office? <laughs> I That is such a great question. And Contrary to probably how this seems, I am an introvert as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I also recognize that, you know, the job that I have chosen to be in does require me to, to I call it people. I need to people a lot. Yeah. Um, but being authentic to me never means you be something other than yourself. Um, if you're an introvert, stay an introvert but you do have to just find the ways that you can be an active member of your workplace without compromising what's comfortable to you. And there are times that I think we, we need to be pushed out of our comfort zone, but I also recognize that that's not easy for everyone. And we, I would never want an introverted employee to change who they are. Um, one example, I have uh, somebody on my team who is uncomfortable with their camera on and I'm okay with that. She shared that with me and we had that conversation and I, I said, look, I, I love when people turn their camera on, but I'm absolutely comfortable if you don't want to do that. It's, it's what you're most comfortable with. Um, and a lot of times people are like, ah, oh, come on, you know, turn on your cameras, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I always say, Hey, it's up to the individual person. And honestly, there's days I don't turn on my camera because I haven't brushed my hair or I just, I don't know, there's chaos going on in the background or I just don't feel like it. And so I think it's finding the opportunities to embrace your own personality. And it's also being as honest as you can with your leader to get that support. Um, another example of what I've done with individuals on my team uh, who they're just not comfortable speaking up in meetings, but they have incredibly valuable insights. And so what I always try to do is at the end of a meeting is say, hey, if you have thoughts and, and you didn't share them or you're not comfortable sharing them, approach me afterwards or send me a note um, because I, I do want to hear from individuals. Um, I think what makes our workplaces so fantastic and dynamic 
are the different personalities. We can't have everyone be an extrovert because then you don't get work done. And, you know, everybody's like trying to get the, the bigger voice. That doesn't work. We need that beautiful balance of personalities across the spectrum. And um, there's so much that individuals who are introverted can share and offer. Um, oftentimes they have the best observations about team dynamics. And so networking in those ways, offering those dynamics in an environment that you're comfortable with in. So is it having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a leader or a manager um, versus doing it in a large group setting? It's just being more creative in how you do that. Yeah, and I think it's so important that, I mean, you sound like such an empathetic leader too. And I think it's so important to have those empathetic leaders in the workplace, just, you know, people that understand. I'm I'm personally an introvert as well, um, even though I'm doing this right now with you, Shireen. Uh, this is very out of my comfort zone. And I agree. I think I know personally, I, I like to be pushed out of my comfort zone every so often, but I definitely have my limits. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's important to me to have um, empathetic leaders to go to as well. And it's important for everyone in the workplace to understand that, you know, some some of your peers might operate differently than you. Um, and I'm so glad that, you know, at RBC Wealth Management and in your role in particular, you definitely understand that um, in regards to that, but yeah. Um, all right, and going kind of going off of that mental um, kind of those boundaries and, you know, our previous questions, why do you think it's important to, prior, to prioritize mental health in the workplace? I think that, you know, big picture, mental health is going to be the largest health crisis bigger than any pandemic could ever be. I think it's already becoming that. Um, and I think it's really important to focus on it in the workplace for a number of reasons. Companies have power, companies have money, and companies can support the benefits and they can support the dialogue, which I feel is so important to reduce the stigma associated with mental health, mental health challenges. You know, there's mental well-being and there's mental health and mental health challenges. And I think talking about them at work, um, making resources available, making it part of the conversation is incredibly important within the organization, but it's as important for the company to do so within communities. Um, we are partnering, and I just have to talk about this incredible organization um, that we started working with last year. It's called Love You Cookie. And it's this wonderful grassroots organization that was started to really help individuals that are on the front lines during the pandemic with mental health challenges and crises and individuals who don't have the benefits themselves. And companies can sponsor it and they send out these amazingly delicious cookies to first responders. And along with that, they're given access to mental health resources that are paid for. Um, just having that direct impact. And that's something our company is able to do because we have the resources and we have the power to do that, that we can help communities, you know, the communities that we work in um, with those kind of challenges. So I think talking about it is imperative and the more visible leaders talk about it, the I think better we're all going to be. And it's not only talking about it, it's also supporting employees. It's giving them the time off. It's giving them the autonomy and the ability to take time away when they need to and normalizing a mental health day. Um, RBC, we've given mental health days throughout the pandemic in addition to your regular paid time off. Um, we have given free year subscriptions to Headspace for people to work on meditation and mind calming, um, in addition to other resources. But we need to, as leaders within companies, make it okay for employees to focus on their mental health as well. It can't just be talking about it. We've actually got to create the space so that employees can take the time they need to balance their workloads, to balance their lives. 
Gotcha. That is, yeah, that is so great to hear that RBC Wealth Management is just prioritizing that because I know I definitely think that there's so many companies that could really benefit just by recognizing mental health and just bringing into the conversations and such. So I'm so glad to hear that RBC Wealth Management is doing that mm -hmm. as well. And I know we've talked so much about setting boundaries um, in this conversation so far, which I think is so important. Um, so we did have another question asking about setting boundaries, but we just had two great audience questions come in. So I really want to touch on those really quick. Um, so the first one, we have been giving work from home days. However, the advisors don't understand why we, the client associates, need to work from home. They don't understand how more productive I can be at home. How do I make them better understand? I, this is such a great question and it's such a common misconception, not on the question side, but on the pushback to work from home. And, you know, this individual sounds like financial services industry. They're working in a branch, um, probably an RBC branch. Um, and here's, here's what I have said from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we had a very traditional structure where, particularly in the branches, nobody worked from home, nobody worked remotely. The pandemic hit, people didn't even have access to work outside the physical office. So we made that change. But not everyone's mindset around it changed when the technology did. And there's... I think a misconception that your place that you're working is somehow related to your productivity and your performance. And I am a firm believer that those absolutely are separate conversations. Um, just because you can't see someone, that shouldn't be the measure of whether they're productive or whether they're working. Mm -hmm. um, instead of focusing on where somebody's physically located, let's focus on the work they're getting done the job that they're doing versus can I see their eyeballs X number of times a day? Um, and that's that's a, a, a mindset change that we really need to be making. And some are faster at making it than others. And part of that discussion is also like, well, people are off doing this and that and they're not, you know, working and they're not doing this and they're, you know, poor performers. Again, Performance is a separate issue. You manage performance based on the work product, what's getting done, what's not getting done. It, where somebody is working, that's separate. Those don't, they're not related. I also often say, if you have a poor performer, they were a poor performer in the office, that's not new. That didn't just start because they're now working in a different location. That's someone that needed some support or some coaching in the office, it's now just exacerbated remotely. So it's helping people understand the productivity. And, and I also feel in this day, and particularly this job market, we have to be flexible. We have to modify our employees' work schedule so that they can be hybrid, so they can do more work from home, because we will not be able to retain them. If the financial services industry continues to be very rigid and you have to be in the office, we will not get people in the industry. We will lose people to other industries and we will not get new talent into the industry. So we need it for our own survival. And it's also the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to support employees. Um, I know how much I appreciate it. I've got a service person coming or again, I just don't want to go into the office. Like I want that extra hour to get work done or, you know, maybe to sleep in, I, who knows, but to trust our employees to be doing their best regardless of where they're at. Yeah. And that trust is just so important. I, yeah. And trust and flexibility. I think companies, oh, I'm hoping, you know, we get to a point where companies are just more, understanding and flexible in regards to, you know, people wanting to work in a hybrid position or even just a fully remote position. And I'm hoping that we are slowly getting to that point. Um, just because I know I personally work a full-time remote position and I absolutely love it. And I think I'm so much more productive 
than I would be in an office just because, as I mentioned earlier, I am an introvert. So I think when, you know, I'm in an office with others, I obviously enjoy making conversation, but I think I get just easily distracted by that. And I think it overwhelms me at a, to a point that I don't get as much of my work done as I could when I'm just focusing in at home. So I think that's just a mindset that, you know, companies should really keep in mind mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the second audience question around setting boundaries for you. The pandemic afforded organic boundaries while working remotely. Post-pandemic post -pandemic work life seems to be intrusive without the organic boundaries in place. How do we effectively set boundaries to preserve our own energy and space? That is a great question. And it's, it's so... I find it, I don't, it, funny is not the right word. So I, I don't want to say that, but it's so interesting to me that at the beginning of the pandemic, most of us were so, we were struggling to find boundaries because we were used to the boundaries of you commute into work and then you commute from work. And so you have this natural break from your work and home. And then we lost those. And so then we had to figure out how to put those in place. And so I think so much of what we need to do is to go back to some of those boundaries, those natural ones that we had when we were in the office. And, you know, again, one of the things I really enjoy not talking and not being on when I'm commuting. Mm -hmm. So unless I have to, I don't make phone calls on my drive. I don't. I don't do that. I do something like a podcast or something that takes my mind somewhere else because that creates such a nice boundary for me. I also think, you know, I work hybrid. So I am working to structure my calendar so that when I am in the office, I can make the most of that time. So I don't want to be in the office sitting in front of a screen for 10 hours. So what are the meetings that are going to be in person? What are the things that I can accomplish most efficiently in person? And then on the days I'm remote, do the ones where, you know, the, the people on the call are all over the country. So we're not all in a room anyway. So structuring your days that way. And I also think it's finding those spaces at work to physically create the boundaries. So I was talking to someone the other day and He's a senior leader and he gets his lunch and he sits in, we have these lunch areas on each floor and he sits in that lunch area by the window. Mm -hmm. Most of us get our lunch and we bring it back to our office and we eat at our desk. And he said, that is one of the best times of my entire day because it's 10, 15 minutes, but I just reset. I get away from the computer. I get away from the phone and I just reset. And I thought that that was so poignant. I thought that was so great. So I did that one day because I always grab my lunch and come back to my desk and eat while I'm working. And um, I had so much more energy, so much more mental energy after just a 15 minute break. So um, it's finding the physical spaces and the change of scenery, because if you sit at your desk all day, that gets really draining. Um, so whether you have the wellness rooms like we have, or, you know, cafe spaces, or it's literally just stepping outside, we have a terrace on our building and it's beautiful. Um, just go out there for 10 or 15 minutes and then come back to your desk. And I know, I know what my calendar looks like. So I know how easy it is to say it and how hard it is to do that, but just carve out a little bit of time to physically get away from the computer and the desk. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much for sharing that insight. I, yeah, it's so funny that you mentioned the commute because I, I was just, I forget what radio station I was listening to the other day, but um, this, this man was on to spotlight kind of remote work and what mm -hmm. have you. And he was talking about, you know, setting boundaries as well. And what he does at the, he works full-time remote as well. And what he does at, at the end of the work day, he gets in his car and he does a little trip around the block and then comes back home. And that's his way 
of kind of separating yeah. work life and home life. I just thought that was so funny because I love yeah, that. Yeah, isn't that great? I, I love that. I think that's. I mean, if you need, I mean, anyone who needed that tip, I hope that helped. <laughs> at all. But I just that made me laugh. But at the same time, it's just that must if it works for him. It mm-hmm. can work for other people as well. Yeah. So, yeah, just finding what works for you um, and setting those organic boundaries and just, again, finding what works for you is just so important during these mm-hmm. times. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, thank you again, Shireen, for sharing that insight. All right. So we're going to switch topics really quick. We're going to talk about benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, while many people are well-versed in their own company's benefit options, It can be challenging to consider all angles of a benefits package at the early stages of your career or as you advance through different life stages. How can we maximize the benefits available to us? And what steps do you recommend for those who want to ask their employers if it's not available to them without feeling guilty? Okay, so first, um, about 50% of our population do not have the word guilty in their vernacular. I'm stereotyping, but I think you know what I mean. Remove it from yours. Remove it from everybody on this call. Guilty is not a word you need to worry about. You have every right to ask about benefits. You have every right to advocate for benefits. And there is a a half of our population that is much better about doing that and certainly don't feel guilty about it. So we should be advocating, we should be asking. And one of my one of my personal experiences, it was my first day as head of HR. And I went to an event um, and it was with this phenomenal organization that I still get to work with within RBC. And I walked in the door and I don't think I was in there five minutes before somebody walked up and started in about, we need to do this about this benefit and this benefit and la, 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 la. And I, I was so overwhelmed and I wasn't even sure what she was talking about, but she advocated and we made the change. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that there was this specific issue as it applied to this population of employees, but she pushed and we made a change and we fixed it. Um, had she not done that, we wouldn't have known. We didn't understand how that benefit played out and what the cost association was for that group of employees. So absolutely advocate. Um, The other thing I would suggest is oftentimes, and and I'll just speak from my personal experiences, you know, you're learning about the company benefits and you focus on, you know, the medical insurance. That's the big one, right? So you look at it big picture. What I would also suggest is that's important. And the next step is think about what changes you might go through maybe in the next five years or maybe in the next 10 years. You know, don't worry about to retirement, but what are the next phases? Like, are you thinking about having a baby? Are you thinking about adopting? Are you thinking about a leave of absence because of, you know, a planned trip, something along those lines. But look at the detail and look at how your company supports you. Um, I think it speaks volumes about a company when you look at the benefits holistically. So not just the health benefits, those are huge. But what other benefits does the company provide that support you, not as an employee, but in all of the dimensions. I always think of employees like we're multidimensional. I'm not just the head of culture. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. So how does my company support all of those facets? Because a good company that leads with employees is going to look at all of those aspects, not just the nine to five aspect of that employee. And there's there's some really unique benefits. Like I just some examples from our business, RBC Wealth Management, like we have this incredible program with Milk Store. And it's this great organization that supports working mothers who are traveling, that are nursing. So I personally remember trying to travel and, you know, you are carrying your breast pump, you're trying to figure out where to store milk, and then you take it through TSA and they put the little test strips and they're testing your gold, which is now ruined, and you can't give it to your baby, right? This company, you go in, RBC 
pays for it. You go in, you say where you're traveling to, they send all the supplies there, and then they ship the milk back to your baby for you. So you don't have to deal with it. But that's something that removes a barrier for nursing moms. It should be up to the mom to decide whether they're going to continue to nurse when they come back to work or not. That shouldn't be something that they're forced to decide because of a barrier that is in the workplace. Um, we are rolling out a sabbatical. Going to that mental health aspect, like we need to support time off and especially recognizing long tenured employees with the opportunity to take paid time away in addition to their um, their regular PTO. Um, a couple other programs we have and, and I used personally is we have a second medical opinion option. I, one of my kiddos has some medical challenges and we were struggling with a diagnosis that he had received and just didn't know what to do. We have this second opinion, uh, advanced medical, and I was able at zero cost to me, have a panel of experts across the country weigh in on his diagnosis and I got a three ring binder of so much information and opinions um, that I just, it means more to me than I can ever express more than a paycheck. I mean, mm -hmm. I need a paycheck, but yeah. that kind of support for me is that's what is so meaningful. And so looking at it big picture, but then what are the phases that you might be engaging in, in the next three years, the next five years, that would be important to look at those benefits. Yeah, I think that's such good. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is such good advice because I know growing up, you know, I was just told, you know, plan for retirement, only plan for retirement. It's just mm -hmm. kind of ingrained in your head, but it's so important to think about, you know, the other life stages, marriage, having kids, you know, mm -hmm. what have you and so on. And I think that that's that advice that you just gave is so important. It's definitely thinking about the big picture, but it's also thinking about, you know, the little things that happen or the big things in your life more, more like that happen throughout the way as well. And thinking about it like that. So thank you for sharing that, Shereen. All right. And moving forward, I know we've been talking about, you know, the remote work life, the hybrid work life and such. So as we think about the future of work, are there any positive outcomes or changes you hope will remain for women or employees in general moving forward? Yes. So <laughs> it's hard to say that I have a favorite thing from the pandemic, but my favorite thing from the pandemic is seeing people's lives. So prior to the pandemic, it was like you checked your family and your life at the door and you walked in and you just become this one dimensional employee. But we got to go into people's homes. And my favorite part of meetings was seeing a, a kiddo or a pet or a partner um, in the background and saying hi to them. I, you know, people would always apologize like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Tell me about them. Like that. <laughs> that's what's meaningful. And I don't want that to go away. I want us to carry that forward where we are real people with real lives, not just employees. And I love seeing that. I love hearing about it. Like I've met pets that I've heard about. I've met kids that I've heard about. And it's just, it's such a different type of intimacy with employees. And I, I love it. It has absolutely been my favorite part in just connecting with people because you had to be so much more intentional about connecting um, because everybody's remote. So it doesn't just happen organically in the hallway. So reaching out and just connecting, we did a number of things where we would have a, a team gathering and we, you didn't talk about work, like that was off limits. And so we did scavenger hunts where you ran around your house looking for things, or we did happy hours. We did code names online. I mean, you name it, where it was really just hanging out and spending time and connecting with your colleagues. And I love that. And I can't imagine, you know, pre-pandemic sitting in, you know, a conference room playing code names with my colleagues, like in the middle of the workday. But that's what that's what we're doing. And I hope we continue that. And I hope that particularly 
women who are managing so much. And again, I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm in a stereotype here, but we tend to manage the kids, the caring for our elders, um, you know, all of those different aspects that we continue to advocate and to make that a present part of our work environment, because that is part of us. Like, I'm going to talk about my family. I'm going to talk about a challenge or that I need to go and, you know, pick up the kid for an appointment. Like, I'm not going to hide that anymore. Yeah, definitely. And, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't hide that. I mean, that's such a, you know, it shouldn't just be, you know, work and then home life, everything should be interconnected. And I'm such a strong advocate for that as well. I think I love seeing at, at Fairy God Boss, we have a Slack channel um, about, you know, FGB pets and kids. And you see, you know, the cutest pictures of, you know, you know, the, our employees' kids going off to kindergarten or just seeing like cute little, you know, animals and bow ties and just that just stuff as that. And I think it just brightens the work day and it just makes it feel, I know sometimes we just don't feel connected um, in the remote workplace and the hybrid workplace. And that just really brings it all together. And it really, you know, makes us feel even more connected. So I think companies kind of moving forward and, you know, really prioritizing those events and such, such as the happy hours or the code names and such is so important. Um, and I definitely agree. I think that's such a, such a positive change that's come about from the pandemic. And it's something that I really hope continues going forward. And our last question for you, and then we'll get to some audience questions, definitely. At Fairy God Boss, we have a tradition. What we have observed is that women do not feel comfortable enough bragging or taking ownership of all the amazing things that they achieve. Would you be willing to role model for us and share an accomplish it, accomplishment, either personal or professional, that you're most proud of? Um, of course. Um, and I'd say one it, work one that I'm I'm really proud of is uh, advocating, coming up with the idea and advocating and getting implemented a four week caregiver leave. Um, we didn't have caregiver leave a couple of years ago, and we had a situation which prompted my really pushing for this and I was able to leverage that situation, that unfortunate situation for the employee to get a, a new policy for us. But we had an employee who um, her husband had a very serious accident and because it wasn't her health condition, she didn't get any short-term disability leave or anything like that. And she'd used up all of her PTO caring for him and he wasn't well enough for her to come back to work. And that really, I really struggled with that. How do we support that employee mm -hmm. um, in that time? We have wonderful benefits, but how do you support when it's not a new baby or an adoption or it's not your personal medical condition? So I went to our CEO and I made a business case and it was a huge expense for the company. Um, and it was a tough pill from that you know, standpoint to swallow, mm -hmm. but he said, yes, and we rolled it out. And so now every one of our employees is eligible for four weeks of caregiver leave to take care of a, a sister or a child or a parent, um, which I just think is becoming so much more prevalent where we are in that, so many of us are in the sandwich generation where we're caring for our kids and we're caring for elder family members and there just aren't enough hours in the day but we need a paycheck. So mm -hmm. I'm really proud that um, I was able to push that through and that, you know, it's a meaningful time for employees. Yeah, that's incredible that you were able to, you know, really push through on that and really, you know, bring that up to, to RBC Wealth Management. I think that's incredible. I, yeah, that's such an important thing that not many people really I think a lot of people are going through, but I think that HR, um, unfortunately, some there's so many good benefits out there. But I think those benefit there's so many companies that don't offer benefits like that. So that's mm -hmm. so, that's so great to hear that 
and that you really push through on that. And that is such an accomplishment. I know personally, I think that is such an accomplishment. So congratulations. That's Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now we have some time for some audience questions, which I'm so excited about. I see a lot of good ones on here. So I'm really hoping that we can get to as many as possible. Um, so I'll just go ahead and fire them off to you. If that's okay. Yeah. So the first one. I'm starting to see articles in my SM feeds indicating CEOs are shifting from reassuring talk and projecting a softer image due to recession fears. Being more thoughtful about expenses is appropriate, but that blunt talk and emphasis on performance reviews as a communication approach is a, is a strategic error. What are your thoughts on this leadership topic? What are others on this webinar hearing from their leaders? I love that question and I completely agree. <laughs> um, I think that it is a huge miss to shift the focus. Again, I think we learned so much during the pandemic about authenticity and leadership, about really leading with the human side first and the recession or you know, potential recession shouldn't change that. Um, it is unequivocal. Every study will show you that engaged employees are more productive employees. If we isolate and ostracize by punitive measures, by more dictatorial uh, leadership styles, we will not have a more productive workplace. That's not going to get the results we want. Mm -hmm. If we lead with people, if we treat them as humans <laughs> um, and we engage with them and support them, they will be more productive. I mean, there are so many studies out there that show that, and we just need to help our leaders understand that. Um, and it's a conversation I have often at work, and I, I feel very fortunate that our leaders get that, um, and they get it even more after the pandemic, but we need to continue to be authentic. We need to be more nurturing, and I'm using some you know, soft language, but that's what's needed. Uh, the dictatorship is a thing of the past, and it should be even though we need to you know cut costs and we need to be mindful of what is going on with the economy that doesn't mean we change our leadership style or how we engage with our employees gotcha yeah and that's that's so important to remember and definitely you know everyone who's listening definitely you know drop your thoughts and your comments about what you've been hearing um, from your leaders as well, just because I'm sure that's going to be so, so helpful for others on this call just to see that, you know, we're not alone in that, you know, maybe some of our leaders might have a more dict dictatorial leadership style, unfortunately. Um, and it's important just to remember you're not alone. alone mm -hmm. in um, all right. And we have a question that has gotten just a lot of attention and we really want to get to um, so let me jump into this one really quick. Any advice for being authentic while looking for a new position? At 55 plus, I was recently downsized after nine years in a corporate design, having spent about 15 years each self-employed and as a full-time corp employee. I'm tired of playing it safe to earn a paycheck, but I'm wary of appearing too quirky for corporate, too corporate for more creative firms, too experienced for more junior roles, or to entrepreneurial for company roles. Um, so Shereen, if you have any advice for this audience. I am smiling because what an amazing question. Yes. And just all, it, just such a thoughtful and real question. I, I, I can share from my own personal experience and then I'll, I'll share from kind of the, the perspective of the employer. So my personal experience is when I stopped trying to fit into a mold, when I stopped trying to just be the perfect corporate person that fit in the mold, that's when I started advancing and that's when I started making a difference. And it's, it's, it's so, I didn't get it. I didn't get it for so many years. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just do this. And, you know, I wouldn't share my opinions. I wouldn't push. I would just, you know, 
be the good soldier. And once I started speaking up, once I started really pushing on things that I felt strongly about, even when it was against what the leader was saying, that's when I made a difference. And that's when I started getting more promotions. And I don't think that's unique to my situation or the company I work at. When I look at individuals, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, oh, we're looking for a good fit. We're looking for a good fit with the team. I don't want a good fit. I want an offset. I, when I look at and hire, I'm looking for someone who does something so much better than me. Um, I always say I am so fortunate to always hire well above myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what we need. We don't need, you know, this, the proverbial Stepford wives. We need people who will shake it up. Corporate needs more creative people. Um, we need different personalities. We need different backgrounds. We need not just the diversity of race and gender. We need the diversity of thought and personality. Like we talked about introvert, extrovert. We all bring something unique to that. And when we're looking at hiring, that's what we need to be doing is pulling together a team that it complements one another. Not everybody's like, oh my gosh, that everybody's just like this person. That's not a dynamic team. Mm -hmm. um, so easier said than done, I realize, but be you, be you. Um, that's who we want to hire. We want you. We want the true authentic you um, and don't pretzel yourself for other people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, nothing would get done if we were all the same too. Mm -hmm. It's so important to have a dynamic workplace. And I think just being authentic in your true self, you will find the role in the company that wants you for you. So mm -hmm. it's just sticking, sticking to your guns on that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And I know we're, we're short on time right now, but I really want to get to this last audience question. Um, can you talk about how employees can advocate for themselves regarding mental health and life balance in organizations and slash or teams that are not as focused on and supportive of mental health? Yes. Um, find an ally. Um, even organizations that maybe don't have a leader who's openly talking about it. Um, find an ally. And I have learned, and, and um, my personal story is after I had my first child, I experienced very severe postpartum anxiety. I was very, very ill. Um, and I struggled. Once I opened up and found the resources, that was huge. It was huge. Um, but I now make it my mission to share that as hard as it was to admit that being vulnerable, it helps me heal. And it's really helped me connect with people on a different level. So you find an ally, ideally within the organization, or you find an ally, you reach out to me. I, I asked if I could share my email at the end of the webinar because I, I just, I want to make sure that everybody feels like they can ask any question they want. But advocating for yourself isn't something to be embarrassed about. Advocating for yourself is what you need to do. And I often say like, you would do it for someone else. So do it for you. And I'm a, a horrible critic of myself and I would never say the things to another human that I say to myself, but give yourself some of that grace you so readily give others and advocate, advocate for yourself and, and just ask the questions. Um, there are so many more people who are struggling and going through the same thing or something similar that if you open up, you will find them. And it's scary and it's terrifying. And I remember the first day I did and I was terrified, but it is honestly one of the best things that I have done. Um, and I found a whole community. Yeah, and that, that is such important advice. And, I, and I'm sure I know I needed to hear that. So I'm sure so many of our audience members will benefit from hearing that advice as well. So thank you for sharing that, Shereen. 
Um, and two last questions for you. We'll make these really quick. This is our little lightning round. Um, so here we go. So what advice would you give to your younger self? Be yourself. My gosh. Like when I started being myself, it was, I felt so much better, but be yourself, find your voice and be yourself. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So important. And again, that just goes with, we've talked so much about authenticity today. Just be your authentic self. Mm -hmm. And it's again, easier said than done, mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to remember. And our second lightning round question, do you have any podcasts or books you would recommend to our audience today? So I love history, um, love history. So I tend to listen to podcasts in that genre. I am listening now for the second time through a phenomenal podcast um, produced by John Meacham. Um, but it's presented by a, a professor of African-American history. And the podcast is called History is Us. And it talks about the history of the United States, specifically race relations from the reconstruction forward. And it is, it is just so fascinating. And it's so hard as well. It's, it's hard. It's depressing, makes me angry. Mm -hmm. um, but I also we got to own it. We got to own our history. We've got to know our history if we're ever going to be better. And it's just riveting. I find it so good. So like I said, it's six episodes. I'm on my second time around. I've enjoyed it so much. Oh my goodness. I will. That is definitely on my list now. Yeah, I think I agree. I think history is so, so important to remember so we can learn from it. Um, and oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to <laughs> learning more about that and listening in. Um, well, our time is up, but thank you so much, Shireen, for joining us today and for sharing such fantastic advice. And thanks to everyone who tuned in for the discussion and your amazing questions and comments. Um, it's always you know, good to see them come in throughout the call. As a reminder, we'll be sending out a recording of today's event along with resources to learn more about opportunities at RBC Wealth Management. In the meantime, be sure to check out RBC Wealth Management's profile and jobs on Fairy God Boss. Also, we'd love to hear your feedback to help us improve future events. So please head to the Type Form tab on the right side of your screen to share your thoughts in a one-minute survey. This just helps us improve our future events and such. Um, and we'd love to know kind of what topics you all would be interested in as well. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you at our next event. Yeah. And thank you everyone for joining. And for the woman who asked that fabulous question, we're hiring. We'd love to hire you. <laughs> yes. Please check them out. Please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you everyone.